Hello everyone, this is Dark Journalist. Today we have a historic breakthrough for you. An exclusive interview with John W. Warner IV, the son of Catherine Mellon of the Mellon Banking family of Pittsburgh, and Senator John Warner III of Virginia, who sadly passed away on May 25th. John is here with us to share the deep history of the Mellon family and his belief that covert forces are using his cousin, former defense intelligence official Chris Mellon, to promote a false UFO invasion scenario that will mislead the American public and the world. Now, the media is playing along with the narrative that Chris Mellon and counterintelligence agent Lou Elizondo are whistleblowers looking for disclosure, when in fact CIA operators are closely involved in directing the buildup of a UFO threat. Chris writes a, 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 an op-ed piece for The Hill that says, I challenge the Pentagon to release more. You are the Pentagon, Chris. Yeah. You know, you represent factions that don't want real disclosure going at all. What are they putting in place? And how does the unknown history of the Mellon family fit into connecting the dots? Let's go ask John W. Warner the fourth. John, it's great to have you with us. Thanks for having me, Damien. I wanted to uh, say that the Mellon family, uh, of which you are a part, is in the they're in the news quite a bit right now because of Chris Mellon, who worked in defense intelligence for George W. Bush and President Clinton, uh, and he's part of this UFO uh, UAP disclosure operation. And of course, he came through the TTSA, coming out and saying, "Well, UFOs are a threat, and we need to get this out to the public that there's a threat out there." What is going on, and and how does the Mellon family feel about? Chris and the things that, that are going on with him right now? Well, that's a difficult question, but um, I can only speak for the, the Mellons I know, my cousins, a few cousins and family members who are somewhat uh, awake as to some of the UFO reality, and uh, but uh, they are not at the level where you and I are. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've known Chris since 1973. You know, we're friends. Uh, it's nothing personal. This is just business, but I... I I've been waiting five years for him to uh, be more forthcoming about this. We, we've had meetings together, we've discussed it. Um, and I asked, I, I begged him to let me help him, but uh, I think he thought I was too much towards the wild stuff as he called it, you know. And- um, that, that real UFO disclosure, shall we say. Yeah, and you know, I drew him a TR-3B and I showed him how, to, how it worked, you know, plasma ring, you know, you know the nodes using, you know, powdered quartz and monatomic gold and plasma and torsion fields. And he would have none of it. He, he just stuck to his, uh, his script. And I got the feeling, you know, he wants to work from a narrow playbook. Uh, I think he represents, he and Lou Alessandro represent a series of faction within the military corporate industrial complex, uh, intelligence complex, um, that wants some kind of disclosure but not too much. And as I told you earlier, it's, it reminds me of a race car on a, on a frozen lake. They keep incrementally putting more power to the ground, but they're only going in circles. Mm -hmm. And I finally, you know, my father and my wife and I uh, agreed that I should at some point come forward and tell my story about uh, the family, which, and then these are my opinions. You know, I don't speak for the Mellon family. I speak for, you know, myself and a small group of people, you know, on certain things. But, um, you know, that we're not a big family. There's only about 130 or 40 of us alive at any given time. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been told by, you know, people that I've met over the decades, you know, retired admirals and generals and people in the Marines, people close to my dad and CIA, DIA people, uh, I mean, my wife worked for the CIA for many years. The Mellon family always came up in meetings. Mm -hmm. you know, my uncle Tim Mellon owns Pan Am Systems, uh, the railroad in New England, and he told me they haul classified cargo for the intel community. And I'll let your subscribers' or imagination go wild on that one. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a deep uh, history there. Yes. Um, the history that, that I... I'll start with my great grandfather. This is my, there were four Mellon brothers a long time ago, but my great grandfather was Andrew Mellon. Now, this guy was an 
oligarch and a robber baron, bar none. Uh, he was secretary of the tre uh, treasury under Harding and Hoover. He was uh, ambassador to the court of St. James in 1931, a great friend of the British royal family, which my grandfather Paul Mellon was too, and my dad, they both have KBEs. Uh, I met the queen three times, I, I don't know why. <laughs> um, you know, and it, this Mellon history goes very deep. And so Andrew Mellon, he and his robber baron buddies, you know, Carnegie and the DuPonts and the Rockefellers and everybody were kind of in on the Great Depression. You know, they make money on the downside and the upside, mm -hmm. you know, that's typical robber baron stuff. And so, you know, it's not nice history. Uh, Andrew Mellon had intimate dealings with Halmar Schacht, who was Hitler's private banker. Mm -hmm. Um, he had intimate dealings with Sullivan and Cromwell on Wall Street, uh, which is the, you know, the Dulles brothers. Right. And my grandfather, Paul Mellon, was good friends with Alan Dulles. They served in the OSS in World War II together. And so when I started digging into this 20 years ago, uh, I also read Nick Cook's book, uh, The Hunt for Zero Point. And that floored me because... When I was a young man in college at UVA, I was a historian and military historian, Russian history. And I started asking him about what were you doing in World War II? And he had had a couple of martinis and you know <laughs> they were lethal. Um, and he said, oh yeah, I worked with Alan Dulles, my brother-in-law, David K.E. Bruce, who was OSS station chief of London, Alan Dulles was station chief of Switzerland. And he knew General Marshall, while Bill Donovan and Patton, because he fox hunted with them in Middleburg, Virginia. I have a picture of General Patton and Marshall with my granddad. That's um, a close relationship. Yes, he knew all the players. So, you know, yes, his father was a robber baron and, uh, you know, Andrew Mellon was invested in DuPont's nylon for Navy ropes. Mm -hmm. So guess what? He had a hand in and getting made illegal hemp and marijuana, yeah, because now it's a strategic thing, you know, for Navy ropes, hemp ropes, but also, you know, we don't want people, you know, smoking those jazz cigarettes. And um, they don't like know, competition either. That's right. Andrew Rillen also had a hand in putting fluoride in our drinking water. Fluoride is a byproduct of the aluminum industry. And my family, you know, Andrew Rillen owned half of Alcoa aluminum. Wow. So this is history I'm not proud of at all. This is dark history. And, uh, but people need to understand more about the melons. And I've been told by my, this people I've known over the decades here in DC that there's been 40 melons in the Intel military intelligence business um, since World War II. And that's a lot for, given the numbers in my family. Um, so. Your grandfather, comes across as kind of a mystery man. You've told me there are some 10,000 secret documents relating to his work. What was he like? He was a very mild-mannered, meek man, but he was very intellectual. Mm -hmm. um, he was very cold, distant, and aloof. But I got to know him um, over the years. Uh, and uh, he sat me down one day when I was in college I was probably 23 at the time. I said, well, what were you doing with Patton? Because I was a big fan of Patton. I still am. And he said, I was with Patton in Czechoslovakia in, in May and April 1945. I said, oh, that's interesting. And uh, he said, yeah, we went into a hangar. I think he said General Marshall, but I, I think it was uh, I think it was Bruce. Maybe Dulles was with him. I, I can't remember who he said with him, but I know it was a few of Patton's generals. Um maybe Marshall, maybe some of the, I don't know. But they said they walked into a hangar and they saw all the rocket works. And, you know, he said, he did mention something about high technology, maybe lasers and tra oh, transistors. And I thought, well, well, that's weird. I thought, you know, we invented those. <laughs> no, as J.P. <laughs> Farrell says, you know, the, the chemical laser and, and transistors, you know, that's all Siemens and IG Farben. Mm -hmm. And then my, my Paul Mellon said, you know, then I saw, you know, uh, rocket engines, V2 rockets, and all these other things. The, the television camera guided missiles he saw, um, which were very tail end of the war and didn't really work all that well, but they were getting there. And then he saw, I, he said, I saw a disc shaped aircraft. And I said, aha, it was at the Flugelrad 
the one with the BMW or Arado jet engines in a circle and it just spun out of control. And he said, um, no, this one was much bigger. Hmm. Interesting. So that's the Nazi flying saucer is the reference there. Yeah, wow. He did not, that was it. I mean, it was time for lunch or dinner and, you know, and I just thought, oh, that's interesting. You know, I wonder what that was. And, and I forgot all about it. And in 1993, um, I was racing in California and a friend of mine fought, on my team said, you know, I know your dad and my dad and I admire your dad. And I said, oh, thanks. And he said, my dad worked in the aerospace industry in California, um, Lockheed Martin and others. And I said, oh, aren't those the ones doing the, the UFO stuff? Because I had followed Stanton Friedman and I read books on, you know, some UFO books here and there. Uh -huh. um, and he said, let me send you something on the internet that you should show to your father. And I didn't have the internet, so I went home. And I got AOL dial-up. I was living in McLean, Virginia. And uh, I got the MJ-12 files. And I was like, what the hell is this? And then, so I looked up, Stanton Friedman said, well, they're probably genuine. And I was like, oh, shit. So I showed them to dad. And uh, he said, oh, let me borrow these. These are interesting. Okay. And a couple months go by and I said, hey, you know, hey, dude, what about the documents? You know, we're very close. I've been, he took me all over the world with him. I've been to every naval base. I've been to you know, Russia with, you know, to meet Gorbachev and everything with him. I've, I've had a, you know, seen the Navy. I've seen the military at his side. And I said, look, from what I know, <laughs> you know, he knows I'm a sci-fi fan, but he said, uh, no, the, the Pentagon told me it was a hoax. And I said, okay, what do you, you know, gloves are off, father to son, you know, I'm not going to tell anybody what the hell's going on here. And we went back and forth. And I know my dad better than anybody. And I knew he was waffling because he hates lying. He's probably the only politician out there who really hates lying, but he'll waffle. Um, and finally, he said, look, I know you're interested in this, but don't go down this road. Uh, you just, you're not going to find what you want to find down this road. This is national security stuff. The people out west have it all under control, to my knowledge. The military has this, you know, under, you know, intense classification, you know, you won't find anything out. You need to just leave it alone, live your life. And I just said, I cannot leave this alone. This is the reality of our world. You know, people need to know. And he knew no one would believe me. And they didn't. None of my friends or family believed anything to do with that. None of them. This is 1993. I, I was a very young, naive 31. And I admit that I, I really was, you know, I'd been a Star Trek fan all my life. I followed, you know, the UFO movement a little bit, but this was beyond the pale. And uh, I said, well, what the hell are they back engineered? I, I didn't know that term then, but whatever it was, he said, I'm not sure. But I need to preface this story for your, for your fans. Um, when I was a little kid and he was secretary of the Navy and this is 1974, uh, he gave me a, a red parka from his trips to Antarctica. Mm -hmm. And it said Operation Deep Freeze. And I used to actually, I was 12 years old with my friend, we would actually look at his top secret briefings on his desk. He would just leave them out. <laughs> and they were talking about missile silos. And, you know, I think, God, he went crazy after that. He put them all in the safe after, <laughs> damn you kids. You know, the hell, you know, and... <laughs> I'll never forget it. I was 14. I was in Switzerland with him. He had a few drinks. I think Liz Taylor and him had an argument one night. And she believed in UFOs and ET. He sure. was married to Liz Taylor. Yeah. I had many conversations with her about it. She's like, oh, yeah, I saw one with Eddie Fisher. And I saw one with Burton, you know, out to sea. And she was totally on board with that. But dad always stuck to, you know, oh, no, God would never do that. We're the chosen ones. But I, you know, <laughs> he's bluffing. But I, it was 1976. I was in Switzerland. It was nighttime. He'd had a few drinks. And I was only 14, but I was kind of a crafty little 14 year old. And I said, come on, what can you tell me about Operation Deep Freeze? Why are we down there? Why have you been down there three times? And he said, well, you know, we're digging out sub bases with steam drills. 
and there's, you know, we might have a few missile silos down there. I said, well, okay, why Antarctica? You know, why do you need them there? It's halfway around the world. And he looked up, it was a clear night, and he looked up, and he pointed up, and he said, space operations. Hmm. And that was the end of the conversation, and I thought nothing of it. But in 2004, after 9-11, you know, I read Nick Cook's book, and then Igor Wartowski's book, and I started to piece some of this together, and it was super weird, and I thought, holy shit, this is getting too real for me. And uh, between what my grandfather told me, what I've learned from people who told me about him, you know, oh, your grandfather. Now, Paul Mellon has four bronze stars at the CIA. And what I've been told and what my wife was told by others was he has over 10,000 documents that remain classified. Unbelievable. And you better believe the Majestic 12 files are on the internal server. You can't access them without the right authorization, but they, they're there. And uh, my dad and I did two FOIA requests. Both of them came back with three pieces of paper. Fort Riley, Kansas, Cavalry, U.S. Army Cavalry, Paul, May Paul Mellon, Major, height, weight, serial number, and type of horse and saddle. He was in charge of the saddle race. And I said, this is ridiculous. And my dad was said, this is ridiculous. You know, he still has a security clearance. But of course, as you and I know, there's, there's hundreds of levels of security clearances. Yeah. And this is an aside, but I was uh, doing some research on Admiral Rico Boda. Okay. He was in, in charge. He's an Australian, but he was in the United States Navy in the 30s and 40s, and I think the 50s. And um, he was a naval aviator. The only reason we have a photo of him is because this naval aviation site is a memorial to all the people involved in that wing or unit. They have a picture of Boda. And that's the only picture. And I said, can we do a FOIA request on Boda? He said, no problem. The Navy will give me anything I want. First, they denied it that he even existed. So my dad picked up the phone. He says, I'm looking at a goddamn picture of Boda right now. And I'm here, you know, this Naval Aviation website, he, the goddamn guy existed. Well, guess what we got? One page. Height, weight, serial number, his unit, and that's that. So now Admiral Rico Bodo was mentioned in uh, William Tompkins' book. Mm -hmm. Now, William Tompkins men mentions a circle of admirals that are behind him or were. And my friends have identified three of them, and they've said, those are stand-up guys. So that's all I wanted to say. That's kind of It's really topic. interesting. He kind of comes out of yes. you know, the shadows yeah. there. I don't know about the rest of William Tompkins' book, but that part... That's what we found out. And my dad was really angry that they wouldn't tell him more about this guy. And so this was years ago. And so my dad got the idea that they're, they're really holding back on a lot of this stuff. He was starting to learn because even though he'd been the head of the Navy and he became a, a senator from a powerful state, he was starting to realize they're keeping a whole lot, even from people on my level. Yeah. I mean, you know, I asked him if he was a magic member, majority for Joint Intelligence Committee. And he said that they didn't call it that, but he knew what I meant. You know, he was, uh, he was on the select Intel committee and he was chairman of the armed services committee. And so he's like, I can't talk about a lot of that stuff, but yes, I was privy to several groups with above top secret information regarding the black budget and other things. And so he has, you know, Stephen Greer came out, I think in 2010 with, you know, Oh, I had tried to ask Senator Warner about that. And he, he refused. So my dad did confirm that. Um, okay. So. Uh, Do you think your dad was concerned that the secrecy was corroding the country later in life? Yes. There's no doubt. And I, I, I said, this, the secrecy is a slow death knell for this nation because it, it's not the majority of people in, in the, uh, military services it's that five percent of guys who change uniforms five times a day that wear black hats and are in unacknowledged programs special access programs that are unconstitutional and illegally funded right now he had a hard time believing 
some of that, but he did tell me that he's heard things like that. And so uh, I think, you know, my dad was a patriotic guy. I think he towed the line. You know, he, he was very respectful to all the admirals in his office, like Bobby Ray Inman. I knew him back when I was a little kid in the Pentagon doing my homework. And my wow. parents were divorced. I started going to the Pentagon in 1968 when I was six years old, when he was under secretary of the Navy. Yeah. My, my father had been an advanced man and a good friend of President Nixon in both campaigns. He was a speechwriter as well. And so Nixon, who's a family friend, he used to come over to our house for dinner. I mean, we used to go to the White House parties and, and all that. I mean, he was a hero of mine when I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the whole John Trump Nixon thing is real deal, as you have well pointed out in yeah. your work. Um, but, you know, I asked Bobby Ray Inman in my dad's office. You know, he'd always pick up the phone and Admiral would call and say, yes, sir, well, I'll get that done. Don't you worry. Those sons of bitches in the Senate will listen to me. You know, I'll drag their ass through the cactus. You know, and he would get things done for the Navy and Marines, uh, which is why they he didn't want it. But they put his name not only on a submarine, but they they put his name on the on the Marine Corps school, one of the buildings in the university there. But um, I'll try not to go down too many tangents. <laughs> Feel me back in, Daniel. Um, the background's really good, actually, and I think hearing about your dad is important just to get his his viewpoint on this. He, uh, you said that he was kind of supportive of you coming forward and exposing some of these things. I find that interesting because after a career lived in that environment, he realized, you know what, none of this is worth it unless we get through that wall of secrecy. Well, my dad's record is public. He was a politician, but he really did care about the American people and the people of Virginia very deeply. Um, I think the outpouring of grief uh, since he's died um, has been very telling. I mean, I, I didn't realize how many friends I had until I like 200 emails. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he really was that guy. Uh, he was a, a genuine guy. Yes, somewhat naive on, on some of this stuff, uh, but and perhaps not read in on most, but he really did care about people. And through me, um, I think he, his knowledge level grew, but he started to get older as well. Mm -hmm. less um, and he was pretty good up to the end. I mean, he was still pretty good. Um, he was a, a brilliant politician. I'll give him, give him that. But yes, he uh, did urge me. He said, you need to do what you have to do. I trust your judgment. I mean, he raised me with a very strong ethical background. He's like, look, you're a wild man. You're a racing driver. You can party with your friends. I understand that. But never forget your ethical, you know, fundamental. And my best friend, his father was the Bishop of Washington, John T. Walker. And my friend Tommy and I, you know, we, we lived under the shadows of great fathers. Um, and we were wild boys, but we always had that moral center that was rebar and concrete. And uh, that served me well through life. Um, Did he give you any advice in terms of dealing with Chris and the UFO invasion op? He knows Chris. He's, he knew him for decades. And I said, look, you know, it's nothing personal against Chris. I like Chris, but he's not telling the whole truth. He's lying by omission. And I think in some cases they're lying outright. And he does not speak for the Mellon family, which unfortunately he never said he did. But, you know, I get emails from family members and other people and say, why are the Mellons involved in national security cover up and UFOs? And I'm like, well, <laughs> uh -huh. you wouldn't believe me if I told you. But, you know, it's the impression is he does. He does not speak for the you know, Mellons I know, at least. I'm sure there's the 10 percent that are very conservative, that work in business, law, aerospace or you know what have you banking you know that are like well you know what's good for national security is good for our portfolios mm -hmm. and so you know let's talk about chris for a moment um he's out there with lou elizondo who is a former counterintelligence agent worked for the cia worked for james clapper john brennan and those types of guys he came out as you know, his, his latest role is I'm a whistleblower. I had to get out of the Pentagon and tell everyone about UFOs and all the rest, saying that people inside the Pentagon didn't take the subject seriously, which on the face of it sounds absurd because we know the Pentagon takes everything as a threat. Um, Elizondo and Mellon 
have now kind of come out of the crashed TTSA operation for the past few years where they did TV shows and all the rest of it. But the two people that are coming forward, it seems, are kind of an odd couple, <laughs> you might say. Chris Mellon from the Mellon banking family, background with George W. Bush uh, intelligence in defense intelligence and worked with for Clinton in the late 90s. Um, what's going on with the combination of these two figures being the face of UAP UFO disclosure and the threat narrative? In my view, um, you know, my friend, Captain Daniel Cross, he was ONI for 30 years. He knows Lou. I, I don't. And we had a, a several conversations and he said, you know, you need to steer clear of Luis Elizondo, you know, your cousin, I understand. But, um, you know, this is a guy who is U.S. Army counterintelligence officer, uh, you know, that could talk, talk the bark off a redwood tree. I mean, I've never seen anybody, you know, talk about spinning on ice. You know, I've never seen anybody talk so much and say so little. Yeah. Um, I mean, my hat's off <laughs> to him. You know, right, he's, right. he's got the gift. Um, I, I've known some counterintelligence types, you know, and they call me up and they're like, oh, man, I thought I was good. But this guy, yeah. you know, and they are an odd couple. And when I had my meeting with Chris, we were at my farm and we had a couple of scotches and he said, you know, and I said, well, you know, I don't understand this whole Tom DeLong thing with you and Semi Van and put off. And uh, he tried Chris and Hal Putoff sent me an email and said, do you want to invest in Hal Putoff's quantum underwater communication system? And I said, um, no, don't, doesn't the Navy already have that? I mean, they've right. got quantum computing on the yin yang and zero point energy in their submarines you know, and other ships. You know, why wouldn't they have that? And so that was very odd. So I think Lou and Chris are a very odd couple. You know, it's like the posh Yale, you know, melon, uh, Deputy Undersecretary of, I don't know, what the hell. And, you know, Lou Elizondo, you know, an in-country, you know, tough guy. You know, yeah. I don't know if he was in, into the interrogation business, but, you know, there's some rumors about that. Um, but, you know, I was told, you know, this guy, but you can just, I mean, you listen to him. And he'll speak for two hours and you're like, wow, there's two hours of my life down the drain. <laughs> and he said nothing. And they talks you know, a lot and says not a lot. This, but let me speak to this rubber tire issue that you know the hubcaps flying, and we we think that was a threat. You know, someone threw a hubcap off a roof, filmed it with an eight millimeter, but we take that very seriously. You know, it's ridiculous. Um, you know, and then Chris comes out recently on the Joe Rogan show, and it, and tries to debunk Bob Lazar of all people. Now Bob Lazar, by his own admission, he was a physicist and an engineer, and said, "Look, here's what I saw." Here's how UFOs fly, and that's it. I don't know anything about the politics or, you know, you know, Mars bases or moon bases. I don't know anything about that. It's just the hard, I was there in the hardware. I did my job. They blank slated the hell out of me, and, you know, yada, yada. Have a nice day. And Chris has to come out on the Joe Rogan show and debunk him? Yeah. You know, there's a million other people. That's low-hanging fruit. Yeah. You know, they go, they, they go on shows where the hosts, like George Knapp, and I don't know. Richard Dolan, you know, I, I appreciate Richard Dolan. You and I, his early work was foundational, but now he's trying to make friends with these guys. And it's like, um, no, yeah. in my view, that's the wrong tactic. Um, you're not, you can't, you know, Winston Churchill said it. You can't negotiate with a tiger with your head in his mouth. Wow. That's a really great point. You cannot do that. Well, you know, that says it for the entire UFO community, in fact that, you know, getting more and more into this. And there's so many of them who are getting encircled and, and getting wrapped up in and entangled with this Elizondo TTSA off, which is all about a threat. There's aliens, uh, the UFOs are up there, they're a threat. And what are we gonna do? You know, I'm a whistleblower, I'm coming out to say this and all these people need to protect me. I mean, it's ridiculous. Well, I mean, can you imagine you or me or Greer or Linda Moulton Howe or anybody debating Lou and Chris. Right. Yes. They will never do that. No. I've invited Lou. Too much and we, yeah. we, our yeah. belief systems are 100%. Well, the problem is that their fundamental narrative story is so, uh, you know, invented. 
And the threat narrative is just the, the kind of the cherry on top of the whole thing. What's interesting, uh, it's interesting to me that you said that though, because um, very often when people talk about the Elizondo thing, it's just the latest persona because, you know, he came out originally as I'm disgruntled, you know, my program ended in 2012, but I stayed five more years supposedly because, you know, I was supposed to be this disgruntled employee who left the government because I thought they weren't taking UFOs seriously. But since that program ended in 2012, I hung around for five years. That first of all, didn't make any sense. And then he did a lot of, and this is well documented by people like the Black Vault, where he said all kinds of inconsistent statements. And then TTSA did all sorts of, who are we going to put forward? Are we going to use Harry Reid for this? Are we going to use Elizondo? Are we going to use Chris Mellon? And finally, it seems after all the dust settled, the latest persona is that he's a whistleblower. He's been done wrong. And as we were talking about this Politico article today, he says now, oh, I can't have gainful employment because the uh, the government's against me. He is the government. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I don't, it, it certainly doesn't fool anyone in the disclosure movement, I, I, I hope. Um, the American people are, you know, asleep by design, uh, ill-educated by design, uh, and ill-informed by a corrupt media by design. You know, it's a funny story. This is back in the early 90s. Uh, we were, my dad and I were watching CNN, and uh, the day before, they had really, oof, they had slammed him on something, and he was pissed. And I said, and they were talking about something. I said, Dad, they're lying. You know, Admiral, somebody told us they're lying. He said, oh, for God's sake, that's their job. No, they do nothing but lie. You know, and so I knew 30 plus years ago that the media was just, you know, dog and pony show. They, they, they talk about lying by omission. They just... Oh, there's no UFOs, you know, there's only hubcaps, you know. But to me, in my view, uh, it seems like Lou and Chris are playing from a Pentagon, DIA, something, uh -huh. you name it, pick an alphabet agency, playbook. And the last five years, they've covered most of it. Ah, tab 26. Uh, Lou, it's time for you to go out, go rogue. And, and say, oh, wait a minute, and say, um, yeah, just do your thing. And it's like, it's time to do that. Yeah. And it's like, according to a script. Um, and that, I'm not alone. You know, some of the people I've talked to here at DC, they're like, oh yeah. No, they're on a, they're on a schedule. This has been scripted. It's on a schedule. These guys are, you know, they're not rogue. It doesn't fool hardly anyone. They're not on their own. You know, Chris writes a, 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 an op-ed piece for The Hill and says, I challenge the Pentagon to release more. You are the Pentagon, Chris. Yeah. You know, you represent factions that don't want real disclosure going at all because they don't care about the UFOs and the Tic Tacs, you know, and, and the other things, which are Lockheed Martin. You know, they'll just, what I think they're, they're going for, and it's not too far from what you think, is they're, they're creating a space that's mostly empty, you know, but what they're doing is say, you know, in a couple of years, the Space Force will declare, you know, ah, the triang black triangles and the Tic Tacs, they're Lockheed Martin. See, mm -hmm. there's no ET, there's no, and, you know, nothing. Go, go back to work, go back to school, have a nice day. Right. And I think that's kind of what they're going for. They're going for, not that they're disrupting the disclosure movement, which is growing by the day. I've seen it grow 30 years, I'm sure you have but they're trying to slow it down to this 50 year plan so that everyone can retire into the sunset without this, you know, the revealing of the dirty laundry, you know, and I'm not sure what hundred percent constitutes that, but you and I are both in agreement that there's drugs, uh, you know, the CIA makes movies with Tom Cruise, ha, 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 you know, Scientologist. <coughs> and it, you know, banking fraud, you know, fun, you know, uh, and illegal weapon sales amongst other things, you know. And there's a lot worse things in my playbook on that, but I'm not gonna mention them. I just- That's the real disclosure. Yeah. That's what you're talking about. And that's been wrapped up around the UFO secrecy. The UFO back engineering technology, you know, I'm sure a lot of that's come from crash UFOs, but I wonder if the stories of UFOs just landing and, and somebody saying, here's the keys, what do I get? Uh -huh. Here's the keys to my UFO, you go to town. 
know, I got a, I got a whole cargo load full of spare parts and stuff I've gathered all through the Klingon and Romulan empire, you know, Hey, but what do I get? And they're like, you know, it's like a bazaar in, in Hattusa or Persepolis or even Baghdad. You know, what do they sell at a bazaar? Spices, plants, food, heroin, chocolate, you know. This is actually a good point because your own views you of what, your own view of what UFOs are is interesting here because you've looked into this a lot yourself, as you've said. Your dad uh, was in some capacity related to that magic group. And uh, we know the Mellons, through their intelligence history, have some knowledge of this subject. What do you think is going on actually with the UFO subject? Well, let's go back to Paul Mellon. Uh, certainly the, the Mellon family, we've been in, in the banking industry since the 1880s. You know, we, war's business, you know, the making of weapons, you know, that's America's day job, is preparing for war. I mean, our GDP is probably 10, 20 times what they tell us. Um, and we're part of that, as well as other committee of 300 families. And that's, I believe that uh, these families, uh, you know, I've read several lists of people, but the Mellons are certainly in there. And our access to the British royal family is very telling to me. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, what's good for business is secrecy. And what's not good for business is transparency. Uh, it never has been, it never will be. And so I think we're, in the next 20 years, we're heading for the pinnacle of all this. And uh, it's gonna be a mess for everyone. It's going to be the biggest shit show you've ever seen. But the black hats, the gray hats, the white hats, the disclosure movement, the, the American people, everyone, it's going to be a flaming pile of bonfire. And it's not going to be happy times for anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think Paul Mellon uh, was, since his access to Alan Dulles, I sent you that, you, that uh, CIA missive yes. that was declassified. Yeah, but they regret that now. Um, <laughs> I think I met him as a, as a young child. I remember Dulles Airport and it being my favorite. It's right near our farm, you know. Um, a lot of weird stuff. Uh, his, my dad knew the, all three Kennedy brothers. He went to law school with Bobby. Paul Mellon knew the Kennedys. They, every summer at the beach house there in Cape Cod, we would have lunch with the Kennedys. They were the nicest people. So I don't know if my grandfather did that out of charity or whether or not it was you know, the idea of keeping your enemies closer. Mm -hmm. Because Paul Mellon was a, a staunch Republican. And he and Nelson Rockefeller and other people funded the CIA and the NSA in the early days. He told me that. He was proud of that. Mm -hmm. He said there was very little funding. There was the Korean War. World War II was bankrupted us. Congress had no appetite for any of that skullduggery. But what are you going to do with MJ-12? What are you going to do with Roosevelt's IPU under Doolittle? What are you going to do with Wild Bill Donovan's OSS, which was definitely privy to the UFO file in World War II? Absolutely. They wanted the best minds possible to not only the Galen Ostfront intelligence organization was going to be playing ball with them, but they needed people that were well-traveled and people like my grandfather who knew metaphysics and philosophy. Thanks, Carl Jung. And Mary right. Mellon knew Gurdjieff. And she had read Steiner. And, you know, um, and they that's, your grand, that's your grandmother. Yeah, so I mean, how aren't we involved, the Mellon family? I mean, it's just insane. Uh, we're involved in the metaphysical side. You know, Mary Mellon was a white hat, that's for darn sure. You know, uh, my mother was a hippie. She gave me UFOs and magazines to read in the 70s when I was a kid. You know, she was protesting Vietnam and my dad was Secretary of the Navy in the Pentagon. You know, she was outside with the protesters. She, you know, she's like, don't trust the government. Your dad, you know, Vietnam's a lie. And she was right. So, I mean, I've had, talk about duality. I've had, yeah. I've had this du dualism in my upbringing. You've got these two threads going on. Because Mary yeah. Mellon, uh, who, who died young from a, an asthma uh, yeah. attack. She loved um, horses and fascinating uh, woman and she has the connection as you mentioned with Gurdjieff and Carl Jung and she got Paul into Carl Jung it seems like yes. so uh, she had a big impact there but when she uh, can we talk a little bit about her and her connections sure. um, if we look at her and we think you know 
how is she the, the mystical one? It's kind of interesting when you think about that and her background getting into things like theosophy in the period in the mystery schools. That seems to me, uh, when she marries Paul, that's probably a pretty big influence in their lives. Even the fact that she recruits him into getting these sessions with Jungian uh, analysts, I think that's very interesting. Well, they did it in Switzerland at the Eros conferences. But when Paul was at Yale, he was very bookish. He was also scroll and key. Now, skull and bones and scroll and key are both linked to the Tula Society of Germany. So you can do the math on that one. So I think he was very metaphysical himself. Um, I think that's what they had in common. Yes, horses, but come on. Um, what they had was a strong intellectual, metaphysical and philosophical bond. And so when they went to meet Carl Jung, I think they were both excited to do it. And um, they met him in Switzerland. He had that Bavaria, he had to get an institute in Bavaria somewhere, some house. Um, so I think Paul and Mary were both privy to information regarding the Vril Society and the Tula Society, Germany. Um, that's my personal feeling, uh, given the evidence that I've seen. Um, I think they were very interested, and so was Carl Jung. And was he a Tula? I wonder. Interesting. I, I bet you dimes to donuts. Carl Jung was a Tula Society member. I, I would bank on it. At a certain point, they try to uh, get Carl Jung to be a part of the OSS. What do you think was going on there? Well, I, I think the family story is that my grandfather and Alan Dulles and probably Mary all said, listen, you gotta, you got to help us. And Paul is joining the OSS and while Bill Donovan's going to run it and we're going to figure out all these things and you know, maybe after the war, we'll have disclosure of Foo Fighters and other you know, German Nazi bell technologies and free energy. And Carl Jung was, was definitely on board with that. Mm -hmm. And probably maybe my grandfather and, and definitely Mary. But I think as the war progressed, my grandfather became more and more conservative. And I think Dulles was more of an influence on it. Mm -hmm. By the end of the war, they had this Foo Fighter issue. They had the German Free Energy Project Paperclip. He definitely was involved in that, you know, uh, because the OSS was definitely involved with paper clear after the war. And I was told they had, you know, DC-6s, long range, full of technology and paperwork and personnel. It, the original Berlin airlift was Project Paperclip. You see those DC-6s coming in the Berlin airlift. Imagine them going into Pilsen. And mm -hmm. they refuel in Iceland. And they're, man, they're anywhere on the East Coast of the United States. All they need is one refuel stop. And so uh, I think that's what happened. You know, they probably ship the Bell, I don't know, by train with other technology you know, to a port. And the Allies had the continent of Europe socked in. I think you know they they did a sweetheart deal with all the Nazi scientists, the paperclip guys. I've heard there's 5,000 of them or more, not right. the 1,500 that, that were told. Um, do you think uh, there's something in there on the record about Young giving this group a warning uh, in relation to Foo Fighters and other things? Can you want to talk about that? Yeah, I, I can't remember if I, I learned it from Farrell or someone or I read it, but it makes sense to me. Uh, the word is, the story is that Carl Young in 47 briefed MJ-12. It makes perfect sense to me. You've got Hill and Keeter, you've got you know, Vannevar Bush and others. Mm -hmm. And he said, look, these Foo Fighters, you have to understand, this is what Gurdjieff, Steiner, Besant, Blavatsky, and all these Sufi mystics and all these mystery schools have been talking about this issue for millennia. You've got to come to terms that this war you've been fighting is a proxy, not only a proxy war, but it's probably a mass death ritual in the tradition of Babylon workings. And you can imagine these scientists in general going, oh, shit, are you kidding me? You know, what? You know, and there's a quote by Young, and I don't, I don't have it, but it's in my book. And it said, uh, if you don't get control of this situation, both on the public and the military, it's going to get out of control and the rudder will be removed from our grasp. And he said, our grasp, meaning humanity as a whole. Amazing. And that was prophetic. And you can imagine MJ-12, they sort of, you know, had coffee and, and bourbon. And, mm, fuck him. You know, and when he was out of the room, they were like, ah, come on. You know, exactly. 
we'll glean all the technology we can like the Germans did for weapons. And, you know, a lot of people believed in the Cold War. It was kind of cobbled up on the down low. It was kind of this BS thing. But I think in 47, it, the Russians definitely had aspirations. Um, but later on in the Cold War, they were always cooperating. My dad, we discussed that in the 80s, you know, how on the deeper levels, you know, there's not going to be a nuclear war, you know, most likely. Because mm-hmm. we're always communicating on lower, lower levels, at, which is above top secret levels. And I, I think Farrell mentions that as well uh, in his books. So, I mean, this is a complex, even in my family story, is this convoluted, complex series of dots to connect. But uh, it took me decades to really come to terms with it myself. I mean, I thought, oh, I'm half insane anyway. Or, you know, Maybe I'm just exact, you know, imagining a lot of this. I have a first class imagination. I'll admit that. I mean, every writer needs to have that. Yeah. But this is such a weird, convoluted story. If I wrote it out, people wouldn't believe it. Well, you wrote a novel series called Little Anton. Can you tell us about it? Little Anton is mostly about their Grand Prix program, but as I was in the middle I was writing it, I was deeper into the disclosure movement and I was watching your stuff and I read all of Farrell's books. I read one and I said, I'm reading every single one before I finish this book. <laughs> because I mentioned the Philosopher's Stone yeah, and yeah. Uh, other esoteric concepts. And, and my editors just went crazy. It's like, oh my God, I, I don't understand any of this, but you must know what you're doing, I hope. And so I did weave some of those narratives in there German anti gravity, uh, Walter Gerlach, you know, nonlinear German physics, uh, Sufi wisdom, and everything like that. Um, so it's an epic. Ser- a novel. It's one story, but it's three separate books. It's really interesting. The uh, your mom comes up from time to time in these conversations, uh, Catherine Mellon, and she uh, she seems to have kind of an interesting influence on you in a way, in that she seems more open minded um, in general. You know, as far as like, she seems different than the rest of the Mellons in a sense. No doubt. Um, she is very much her, her mother's daughter. And I think that uh, even though she died when my mother was 12, I think she gleaned a lot from her. And so when the 60s happens, I mean, my parents loved each other dearly. Uh, and they still do. But um, the consciousness of the world was expanding in the 60s. Uh, she rode that wave. And, you know, she, Smoking pot, and you know, she would play the doors for us as kids, and we'd be dancing around with the Beatles and the doors. My dad would be like, Ah, oh, that's jungle music, turn it off. You know, and dad was very conservative and he was involved in Vietnam, the Navy Department. And so they made us, they did a couple of very smart things with us kids. At 6 30 p.m., they made us watch the CBS News every single night from the time I was four or five, one to whenever. And they argued back and forth about Vietnam. So I've always had this conservative father and this sort of hippie, free-thinking mother. And uh, yeah, and she's not alone. I've met a couple of the other metal, melons you know, that are more in that vein than conservative. And so when people think, you know, they say all oh, these committee of 300 families, you know, they're all in cahoots with the cabal in the deep state. And I'm like, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> You it's know. a huge generalization, right? Yeah, it's like half, most of these people are just like the rest of the American people. They're, they're either completely ignorant of what we're talking about. Uh, they're not interested that much. Uh, and the ones that are, are more like, well, you know, the philosophy and the metaphysics. And I'm sure that, you know, the ET is, you know, they're beautiful and they're loving. And, you know, they're going to help us out. And I think that's mostly true, but not you know, it's, they're definitely regressive out there uh, mucking around, not only with our history, but with our present. And I think a lot of dirty deals and alliances have been made. It makes sense given the historical narrative. If you look at the whole thing, you got to put the whole thing together. It's, it's not easy, but it's, it, it's doable. And then the dots connect a little more easily. And so I think my mother, the best thing about her, other than buying me UFO books and Heinlein and, and, uh, Asimov and all these, you know, Dune. Mm-hmm. She bought me when I was 11 years old. It's a picture of me on my website. I'm 10 years old and I'm at summer camp and I have this towel. 
I had chariots of the gods buried in there because my cabin counselor was a great guy. I knew him well, but he very religious. He knew what that book was about. And one kid had it and he ripped it in half and said, this is against God. Huh. So I, I was, you know, I hid it in a box, or, you know, behind the latrine and I'd read it behind a tree. You know, I mean, that's what I had to do. Now, I didn't understand all of it at 11 or 10, really. But in the later years, as I reread it, reread it, I mean, man. And today, that's like UFO 101, as well Absolutely. as Bob Lazar and all that stuff. That's all UFO 101 stuff. Oh, my lab, you know, grays, abductions, genetics. That's 101 stuff. You know, the higher stuff, higher dimensions, you know, you know, dimensional travel, you know, how big is the secret space program? These are the things that people need to really, in my view. Uh, but your, uh, your dad may have given us a hint about the secret space program with his Antarctica comments there. Uh, that's interesting. I would like to say this, that um, you know, when you were at camp, there was someone else there with you at camp, and that was your cousin, Chris. Yep. And Chris ran, uh, according to you, you were saying that he, you remember that he ran this UFO club. He told me when we had our conversation that he started a UFO, UFO club in high school and college. And I think his interest and my, my interest coincided. You know, we didn't see that each other that much. I knew his brother, Matt. He's a very nice man. Um, you know, we had the same interest. I think it, personally, you know, I, I mean, I like Chris, I, but I just... Fundamentally, I go against them now, 100%. This is just enough. The American people deserve much more transparency. I know what they're hiding, you know, some of it, but, you know, it's it's the kind of thing where I think he and I were, would have been much aligned until, you know, I went off and became a, a pro racing driver and he went into the Defense Intelligence Agency or I don't know what his job was hooked up with, probably a lot of those agencies in the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. And I, if I had to guess, I think they said, look, you know, your enthusiasms are right on target. Here's a half inch or one inch briefing. We got to we got to keep this under wraps or people will panic and our enemies in Iran will you know, come after us. Russia, it's always Russia and China, you know. Right. And there is a grain of truth in all that. But it's been pumped up and exaggerated. I mean, Russia's not going to attack us. China's not going to attack us. There are we're their biggest market. <laughs> you know, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. And, you know, I think he was much more conservative than I was. I, I was much, I was conservative as a young, but I had a wild side. I was like, man, Star Trek, it's all true. You know, and he was like, uh oh, you know, I think I'm going to be involved with this. And because, you know, I've met these people and they truly believe they're doing the right thing. They truly believe that. You know, I, I want to protect the American people from the darkness of all this. And the only way we can do that is to keep the lid on this and leak it out tiny, tiny tidbits. And I, I wrote to him recently. And I said, listen, you're going to create paradoxes in people's psyches, which are already going to be freaked out because this is this is going to blow up. Yeah. They're sitting on a giant pressure cooker, you know, huge, biggest hydrogen bomb information the world has ever known and it's not going to end well for anyone involved and uh, the american people they won't know what to believe or who to believe now a lot of people will never cotton to any of this stuff you and i are talking about but right. the ones that do they're you're going to create paradoxes in their psyches i mean they're going to be stuck in bed you know licking windows drooling on the floor and i won't blame them one bit because the secrecy of all this is toxic. And the very few psychopaths have been ruling the roost in whatever compartments or factions or, you know, and the rest of the people have been blackmailed and, and cajoled or kept out of the loop, mostly. Ignorance is bliss, you know. Um, why these people? And I, I think, you know, I think that's what you've been all about all these years with your shows. Absolutely. And it's fascinating when you're mentioning this about Chris, because I think we're getting a profile here. You know, this is a guy who comes out 
And we hear about all these things, uh, you know, that he's in, he's been associated with defense intelligence. He has this kind of long resume and here he is retired in his mid sixties and he shows up as, you know, I'm a UAP threat, UFO threat disclosure guy. And here I am with Elizondo and everyone needs to know about this alien threat. Who do you think is pulling him forward? Because you know him, you've been friends with him for many years, and I think he's even kind of blocked you out because he doesn't want to give you that honesty. No, he doesn't. And I think he's, he very much believes in that one-inch briefing that was given. Why he's with Elizondo, you know, I'm as, I'm as befuddled as you are. It's an odd couple at best. Uh, Elizondo is this, you know, inherently untrustworthy person. That's his job to lie. I mean, you said it a million times. Yeah. You know, why is Lou, you know, and now they're sort of separated now. Mm -hmm. But my feeling is they're still connected. They probably pick up the phone and you know, do some pillow talk. You know, gee whiz, you know, those guys will never figure this one out, you know. <laughs> and it, it's just bizarre the behavior. I mean, yes. Um, I don't, I don't quite understand. I know it's a group of factions within, you know, the Pentagon over there across the Potomac River. You know, I know, and some in the intel community, but they're all, you know, webbed to, together. And so they know they have to do something, but I think most of them are, you know, in the know who are read in. They're just like, well, we got to do something, but let's make it close to nothing as possible. And again, I'll go back to this race car on ice. They keep going faster, applying more power. You know, every time Elizondo gets up there, well, I want to talk and be transparent, and I'm, in, I'm a whistleblower now. He's adding more gas, but they're only going faster in a circle. They're not going forward. They're, you know, they're not going backward. And But they are pushing the narrative sideways. As you could tell with Elizondo, he'll take a, a you know semi hardball question and go, "Well, I can't speak to that, but let me tell you about my aunt in West Virginia who saw a UFO." Well, my aunt is this very intelligent woman, and she used to make me baked beans and hot dogs. And oh, by the way, I've seen a hot dog UFO with mustard, and you know, and and he starts going down this, you know, gravel road. Yeah. You know, and soon it was like, what was the original question? Um, and everyone's forgot about it. Yeah. And it's a microcosm what they're doing on a macro scale. And so it's like, keep everyone confused, keep everyone going in a circle, Push, keep pushing the narrative sideways. You know, I, what did Richard Dolan, he had this live virtual thing that you had to pay for. Yeah. And it's like, I'm not paying for that. You know, it's ridiculous. You can't go to the tiger and negotiate. Right, they're rolling out Lou, and that, what's even worse than like Lou rolling out to the mainstream media is that disclosure community, uh, the alternative research people, that they should be compelled. This is what they're trying to do to compel them to embrace Elizondo now as a victim, as a whistleblower, and everyone has to help him because you know he's the victim of the government when he is the government. That's the real insidious counter intel aspect of this. Well, it's, it's almost hilarious. I mean, you and I laugh about it. I mean, it's just ridiculous. But to the average person, it's not. It's, it's yeah. They're really looking for people to tell them the truth from the, from the government or the military. And it's like, um, you're not going to get that because there's just too much dirty laundry. Um, you're never going to get disclosure from anyone on Capitol Hill, certainly not Rubio and that clown show. You know, that that's, you know, and my dad... It's another thing my dad admitted. He's like, he's like every, every senator and congressman is bought and paid for. And that's why my dad aligned himself with the Navy and Marines, because that's a bedrock foundation. And nobody can mess with you. No, no black hat can lean over your shoulder and, and go, you know, you need to vote this way. Mm -hmm. Because he's got those people. He made those friendships and relationships back in the 70s in the Pentagon when he was Secretary of the Navy. And I know a lot of those people. And... Um, you know, I think he was wise to have done that. And, and you know, it, he had the right uh, alliances. Elizondo running for Congress and Rubio. I mean, UAP, you know, that's a silly Podesta Hillary Clinton thing, you know, Psyop. Exactly. Yeah. And everyone, you know, my friends are like, what is a UAP? What's the difference between a UFO? 
And I said, well, it's just the you know, secret sauce in the middle of the bun. <laughs> yes. Well, that's the marketing, right? We're yeah. going to market this. UFOs showed up in 2017. Lou Elizondo told us about it. TTSA brought it forward. And guess what? Chris Mellon, you know, he's kind of the legitimate one from government who's going to come out and say, this is all real and Lou is real. So if you could, I know that Lou and Chris watch the show when we talk about these subjects. If Chris was watching right now, what would you like to say to him? I'd like to say, you know, you know, I, I know he's not a, a bad guy. He doesn't come off to me that way. I'm very sensitive to people's energies that way. Um, but I'd say to him, you know, and I, I did say to him in a letter, I said, I think they're lying to you on a massive scale. You're the front man for these people lying, either by omission or outright, about what constitutes uh, the UFO file for real, because there's a giant section that's probably 10,000 pages that he's not privy to. And this gets into funding streams or the alliances or deals, you know, with either ET races or whatever that are unsavory at best. And so I think he's working out of a bit of uh, you know, ignorance of that. And I, I, I implore him. And I don't think he's ever going to watch this. I, I wouldn't think he would lower his standards. But, you know, that's nothing on you. Uh, but, it, you know, and, you know, our friendship is probably done. Uh, but, you know, now you understand why they picked him out. Yeah. What I want to tell you and all your people, they just didn't pick this guy out of a hat. You know, it's not just some banking family. Well, we're a banking family, all right. But you need to dig into all this history. And I've told you all about my grandfather, Paul Mellon, Alan Dulles and all that. Yeah, you know, there's yeah. a damn good reason they picked a Mellon. And it's ironic. Here's another one telling you, you know, what it's all about. Uh, I'm trying to think if I've left anything out. Well, there's that one time cigar landed in a field. and um, But... <laughs> they picked they picked one for a reason because we have a history of being loyal to the national security state and the military and the IC. Except for me, <laughs> you know. It's, you know it, it's you know, I never would have joined that show. I don't like wearing coat and tie. I'm not, I'm not into that. And I, you know, if, it, if anything was unconstitutional, I would not touch it with a thousand foot pole. But I don't believe Chris thinks he's doing anything unconstitutional. But unfortunately, I think he's hiding people who have, have done those things. But as you know, it's amazing. You can talk to an admiral or four-star general, and they're like, well, I know about this one gizmo, but they're ignorant of the rest. Right. And Squire talks about that, that with the Joint Chiefs. And they're like, well, I know we've got Area 51. We're back engineering a, you know, a free energy ice cream machine from a UFO. But you know, that's all I know. And it's like, how is it they do not know? Um, they just keep people, they omit the truth and they just talk, you know, the news talks about nothing. They let them oh, specialize. Was a over here and, yeah. Oh, you know, NASCAR race and, you know, oh, pro football's on and then they get four talking heads talking about nothing. Right. Well, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here, but it's just, it's really frustrating. And, um, you know, but there you have it. I mean, they, the forces behind willy nilly, they pick people who are well vetted and have a family tradition with this kind of stuff, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, his presence is very interesting in the middle of this, I have to say. Um, one of the things I'd like to point out is you know, you do you make a really good point that there's two sides there in any family, even in some of these big powerful families like what we're talking about because when we think about somebody like Mary Mellon or Catherine Mellon you know uh, they were coming from a totally different place and the people behind Chris Mellon and what he's been led into the public to represent those people seem to be preparing a false alien invasion scenario a false UFO threat why are they creating a false UFO threat? Well, all your viewers know the Von Braun story. Uh, he warned us about it. Um, 
it's a last ditch effort in my view. Uh, it's, it's scraping the bottom of the barrel. They'll use voice of God technology like they did in the Gulf War. And all the Iraqi soldiers and tanks gave up, you know, Allah says, please do this. You know, right. they did. You know, I mean, it's, they're going to, they're going to pull out any holographic technology they can, they can muster. You know, they'll put out some black triangles, flashing LED lights, you know, like it's Vegas, you know, and people will be confused and, and probably some people scared, but yeah, I tend to believe now this is this 25 year thing. They're 25 years behind the times. 25 years ago, that would have scared the living bejesus out of, out of a lot of people. Today, uh, yes. You think their timing um, is off. You know, it's not going to work. I'll tell you one thing. I support it in one area only. Once they do it, the cat's out of the bag. There's no more debate over anti-gravity or uh, they're still debating anti-gravity, which is pretty simple to do. Mm -hmm. And whether or not there's ET or not, or, you know, it, it would all of a sudden most people in the world would be kind of on the same page, you know. Whether you know, they still people are like, oh no, it's not in the Bible. I don't believe it, or you're a nut job. And you know, it's it it would it would definitely even some of the playing field. Although it would add a ton of confusion and probably some fear. But I think after 9-11, which, you know, 9-11 galvanized this country. We weren't scared. We were one people. Right. Like pluribus unum. You know, um, these false flag things they'll do, they keep doing them. They're only going to unite the American people more and more and more. That's my view. Uh, I think it'll scare a bunch of people, but I think half the country will be like, this is a crock of shit. You know, and they'll be, you know, the 9-11, uh, those conspiracies only keep growing. You know, I, I think the American people have matured somewhat in 20 years since that. That did not work. That galvanized this country. I saw it firsthand. Mm -hmm. Nobody was afraid. You know, in 1939, when, when FDR, the word is FDR and the Secret Service were involved with the CBS radio program, The War of the Worlds, with Orson Welles. Right. And that was 1939. I think Army G2 was in on that. And they wanted to, you know, they had, there were UFO crashes in the 20s and 30s around the world. And they were like, uh oh, we better test the American people. Well, they reported that all these people in New Jersey panicked. And it's like some did. But what I've read in several sources is that most people didn't. Most Americans got out on their porch with a shotgun and said, bring it on. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not gonna let, I'm not gonna let some Martian tell me what to do, what for, you know. They were, they were ready to rock and roll. And they were like, uh-oh, hush it all up and skew it. You know, sorry, we, we do. it's just a radio show. Orson Welles was in on it. It's too smart. Um, so they've tested us before. Uh -huh. But even in 1939, people were like less scared than they were ready to rock and roll with their weapons. Uh -huh. That is America. I mean, God, guns, and country. You better believe it. You know? The state of Virginia, you know, that's that's not going to scare anybody, let alone West Virginia. Those guys will be ready, you know, they'll have searchlights in the skies and any <laughs> aircraft fire. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, they're ready to roll. Yeah, I work with wounded veterans at my farm. My wife and I and my farm employees, we do it twice a year. It's a black powder deer hunt. And so for the last six years, I've worked with a lot of veterans and heard their stories. And I've had a couple of special forces guys. And they're like, I know who your dad is. And we start talking about, it. I said, what, do you, what can you tell me that's above top secret? I'm, I'm somewhat knowledgeable. And they're like, well, I can't tell you much, you know, but, uh, you know, in the Gulf War, in the second Gulf War, you know, we saw some strange black things in the skies, you know, popping in and out, firing at the enemy. And uh, that's all they'll say. That's all I say. And you didn't hear it from me. And I think more than anything to, to work with someone with painful shrapnel and PTSD, uh, I have chronic pain. I have a back full of titanium. I, I, you know, as a racing driver, I've been close to death, but nothing like what these guys and, and gals have been through. We've had a woman two years in a row and they are full of painful shrapnel. And you and I both know the military. And I said this to Chris, that that med bed technology is real. They've had it for 30, 40 years. They can cure anything with vibration, sound, color, and light. 
anything. And they will not let it out. It's for black ops use only. And I've told all those veterans, I said, I'm going to try to work any way I can to you know, at least get that out for veterans. These people, these black hats and these unacknowledged programs, they are unconscionable criminals. You know, forget all the UFO stuff. Mm-hmm. The technology we have that's a benefit of that UFO technology. You know, we're clever too, but come on. You know, could save all these young lives, as well as all the kids with cancer. Hmm. I mean, you've read it. By all accounts, you know, Dr. Royal Rife and everything, they, they could have cured cancer 100 years ago. Yeah. No, they've I mean, suppressed it's, it. It's disgusting. And, um, you know, I, I, I meet these young people and it, it's just, they're in tank tread wheelchairs in complete pain, but they want to be out in the woods. They want to shoot a deer. I, I want them to get them to go fishing, but they want to do this. It's, it's what they want to do. And it just brings me to tears. Amazing. I mean, that's why well, I'm here today. I mean, I, above anything, it's those young men and women that I've met, that I've had the honor to meet. And it makes me damn angry. And it made my father angry, too. Because he knew. They, he's like, you're right. They, they do have stuff they won't let out. Well, they're suppressing that. And, um, I mean, that brings us a lot into kind of the pharma takeover here, because we've seen so much of that in the past year with the COVID crisis and everything else. Um, but before we get into that, I want to jump back to something that you said, um, which was about Von Braun and his warning as far as the alien invasion is concerned. It's interesting to me because Von Braun actually knew your family and there's some evidence maybe that he even met Chris when he was a child. Yes, um, during our conversation, Chris showed me a photo. I I, I believe it was, it might've been him, but another cousin when they were young boys with Von Braun. Now, what I know from, this gets into another Paul Mellon thing that I think your subscribers should know, everyone should know. Uh, not only was Von, uh, my grandfather knew Von Brown. I never met him. I can't remember if I met Von Brown. I've met a lot of people and presidents. But I know the Mellon family of Von Brown and maybe some of the other Germans have, there's some interpolonization going on there. Um, and I was actually surprised Chris showed me the photo. And, and, you know, people don't get this idea that Von Brown is the good Nazi. Yeah, maybe at the end. Mm-hmm. These guys were all SS Nazis. They had a the Pina Muna. They had a death camp with slave labor. Thank you, Hans Kammler. Mm-hmm. You know, um, allow me to, to go off. Oh, yeah. All I've been told by even my father and other people around town that Paul Mellon met with presidents and, and directors of Central Intelligence and other people at his farm in Upperville, Virginia. My grandfather had a jet strip. And it was military length. Nearby is Mount Weather, deep underground military base, which, you know, my father told me he went down several levels and got on the high-speed Mach 2 train. He told me that during 9-11. They whisked all the senators out to West Virginia, not to the Greenbrier, but to another location. But Paul Mellon met with these, you know, Ford, Nixon, uh, Reagan, probably, you know, I don't know, Bush, but uh, he's pretty old by then. But why would they meet at his farm in secret? And my dad did confirm that. He doesn't know what they talked about. But, you know, isn't that what Camp David is for? Mm-hmm. Why do you need to, you know, and my grandfather had security at the yin yang. He always hired, they were very nice. When I was a kid, I loved them. They were ex FBI men. And when I was a teenager, they showed me they had Mac 10s and Thompson submachine guns in suitcases. Wow. Incredible. I know I breached the security perimeter when I was a, a teenager once. I was going to drag race a friend of mine on his airstrip, and they came down locked and loaded, you know. I was like, I got out on my knees. I was like, no, it's me. <laughs> you know, they had machine guns drawn. Wow. Even for a billionaire, that's a lot of firepower. Yeah. The 70s and 80s. Sure, today, maybe. But, I mean, he had a ton of them. And radios inside cars back before cell phones, and, you know, radio telephones. I used to, you know, in his car, and I would lift up and talk to the security guys. I thought that was really, really cool. He had a lot of security. And I know he met with presidents and DCIs. Who else was in those meetings? I don't know. People around town, high level, uh, you know, military personnel and my dad, they were like, oh yeah. There's a definite question mark there with your grandfather. It's like, 
the things that he was involved in, the 10,000 pages, the CIA connections and helping set that up. Uh, not a lot of that's on the record. I mean, you're putting a lot of it on the record today. Yeah, you can look it up, but you know, he was very close to Queen Elizabeth. They had the horse racing thing in common, don't get me wrong. Did they date in the 1950s? I, I don't know. Um, my grandfather's second wife was a pretty nasty piece of work. Um, That's but, funny. Yeah. So the, the royal family would stay with him in Upperville, Virginia, at the farm. I mean, my mother remembers, my remember, mother remembers Ike staying there, you know, in the 50s when he was president. I mean, wow. you know, and people are sending me new stuff that I haven't heard of, you know, every once in a while. It's just like, okay, enough. I, you know, I get it. I mean, the guy was not, you know, this one picture I sent you from 1959 with Jackie Kennedy and Paul. Yeah. He looks like a Bond villain. Yes. And, you know, Ian Fleming was MI6. And he patterned all his Bond books about what was really going on. Right. You know, I mean, it's it's not funny. It's, it's really dirty business. Mm -hmm. it, you know, you're talking about, you know, see, my grandfather was on the CFR, Jason Society, probably the trilateral. I can't confirm that yet. But he was certainly on the CFR. And these, these groups of globalists, they let countries starve. Mm -hmm. And then they come in with the Red Cross. And, oh, World Wildlife Fund. We know what they're, they're corrupt. You know, they get 10, you know, one cent on the dollar or maybe a half a cent. Where should it all go? Warlords, infrastructure. I mean, the guy was, you know, by virtue of the public things, he, you know, or, or in order of orange NASA. Now that gets into the occult, plus scroll and key, the Atula Society. I mean, my grandfather was into the occult with Mary. Yeah. Before the war, when he was at Yale, he told me, I mean, I, I saw the books in his library. I mean, you know, I couldn't piece all this together quite, but when I started watching you, I don't know, 10 years ago, when did you first start? Yeah, that's about right. Yeah. And Greer stuff, and then, you know, my sister, was involved, uh, my sister Virginia was involved with the restoration of Manly P. Hall's library. Yes. And I told you that FDR put all of his, all of that library on microfiche in World War II in case of a Japanese invasion. Unbelievable. He wanted yeah. to preserve it. He understood yeah. the value. And my grandfather's library were full of those books. I understand that he does not the SS one that was hidden behind the, you know. <laughs> No. What I found out was that he donated 300 of those. There's an occult book wing at Yale, but Mellon donated the 300 books that he and his wife had put together for that library. <laughs> so, I mean, it's pretty deep. It's pretty deep. People don't, people don't, people don't believe me. And I'm like, um, well, it's on, it's on the record. You know, the Bollingen Foundation, which Paul dissolved it into the Andrew Mellon Foundation in 1963. Ah. Personally. I think they dissolved the Bollingen Foundation because it was too much of the truth, the esoteric truth of the world at a time when they, you know, whacked Kennedy. And mm -hmm. you know, my grandfather must have known about it. He knew John Kennedy. He knew Ellen Dulles. He's a Republican. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's probably close to MJ-12, helped finance the... You know, I'm going to err on this, that side as far as, you know, what his intentions were. But he certainly, every summer, Jackie and the kids and other Kennedys would come to his beach house. I mean, he would cold court at this beach house. You know, I yeah. think I met Alan Dulles there. I mean, other people would come, shadowy figures. And, and um, God, I remember these people growing up. I had, you know, I had first level access. You know, it was just, a lot of this stuff for me is osmosis. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just sitting in my dad's office, you know, for hours watching the admirals and Bobby Ray Inman and a couple spooks. And they're all going, oh, what do we do with this? You know, whole technology with it. something like that. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's just it gets into your subconscious. It's part of your everyday life. Yeah, What's and most of my friends, most of my friends are just like, yeah, you're making that up, and nobody wants to hear it. Nobody wants to hear this stuff. A lot of people, not your subscribers, not the disclosure movement, the regular people of America. I don't know about foreign countries, but. A lot of it is, is not only cognitive dissonance, it's, they don't, I had a friend who said, I'm sure you're right, but I don't want to know. Ignorance is bliss. They don't want to know. They don't want to put the dog. You actually said that they're in a kind of like violent denial about it. 
that so, is, yeah. yeah. One of my friends said, if you keep harping on this, I'm going to hit you with a baseball bat. <laughs> I think you're serious. <laughs> We've got to try to piece all this stuff together, the bigger picture. And it is coming together. It really is. Um, it's not pretty, but it, you know, it's, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, um, I urge Chris and Lou to, you know, I wish they would have come to Jesus moment. I mean, they, you, know, you know, this stuff that they're hiding you know, or protecting, it's just, they're, it's, they're going to be fall guys. And that's the saddest thing. You know, I don't know Lou, but you know, I, I don't want to see my cousin vilified. I mean, you know, the American people will be very angry someday and they'll come after all of us, maybe. All of us, committee of 300 family members. I mean, who can blame them? Um, but there are a few of us out there you know, trying to do the right thing. You know, Absolutely. Trying to earn all those portfolios, you know, and not try to enrich in ourselves more. Um, there are the, a lot of those people are very generous and charitable people. They sadly think foundations are legit. It's true. That's the saddest part of this. I, I try. And no one believes me. I say, look up Catherine Austin Fitz. These, these big charities, Andrew Mellon Foundation, don't give to that. They're, a lot of that money is, they think I'm crazy. I mean, that's amazing. That's amazing. That's really an education issue because yeah. you need to become educated about that. And I agree with you that Catherine's work is really a good way to go into that because she understands the money flows. She understands that background. Uh, with the foundations so that's a big one i'm glad you mentioned that actually yeah because wealthy people by and large that's how they give to charitable and they are i, I think the people i've known are very generous sure. uh, my family, for sure but remember when my grandfather and his father donated those national galleries on constitution avenue you know that's a good thing for the people of america but it's also putting a gold wreath on your head and saying look what a great a guy i am." right you know Reagan and Bush both gave my grandfather medals of, you know, for all his philanthropic work. And I'm like, now I think I understand how that works. You know, they're like, awards are given out to people that have done their bidding, the deep state and other people. And they're like, you know, even if they realize what they've done, you know, what do you do? You know, you've done this great thing and people think you're a great guy. And oh, I, I can't, can't tell you how many people go, oh your grandfather was just a wonderful generous person and i'm like yes but <laughs> guess what what else he was into you know they're like, they just look at me in a blank stare but that's the national galleries of art you know that was a good thing for them to do but it's also a self-serving it's interesting it's like a philanthropic uh, thread that's there it's like, and they understand that there's like a foundation of enhancing the culture, art, music, and all these things. And that's good, actually. That's fantastic. And they do make a difference, but it's it's linked in with this other thing. So it's almost like I get this really good public image from doing this, but behind the scenes, I've been involved in very nevarious stuff. Yeah, it's, you know, you know unfortunately, if you back to metaphysics, it's, it's our own duality. I struggle with mine. You know, it's it's like, oh, I've done all this horrible stuff. Well, mm, that's karma. I better I better do something good in my lifetime to make up for all that. And I think Paul Mellon, you know, he's very distant and seemed very depressed and, uh, a lot of times. And uh, I wonder if you know he had that some ethics, but you know, because of he believed in national security and the Russian threat or whatever it was, and he was like, well, I had to do what I had to do but I'm not happy about it. I, I think, you know, my, my mom said, you know, one time that he was a different person after they assassinated Ken. Uh, so I, I think maybe, maybe he had a, a moment where he's like, Jesus, I've been involved with the worst people and now they've killed. You know. But I don't know, maybe he knew about it. Well, he had the friendship with Dulles. Uh, if you're pals with Alan Dulles, Sorry, that's the worst man in, in, in American history, just about. I think who's worse? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's just fascinating in that sense um, that connection 
But it's interesting what she says, too, because we know that there is this relationship with the Mellons and the Kennedys, and maybe they were disturbed genuinely by the whole thing. It's very interesting. You know, I mean, people do a lot of very salute the flag, uh, very, very neocon uh, deeds and things. And then later on in retired life, they're like, oh, shit, what did I do? Yeah. You know, I mean, it happens to a lot of us. I mean, I'm not proud of some of the things I've done in my life. You know, it's like, oh, I'm such an idiot. Um, but, you know, it's something we have to come to terms with. And it's just, right. it's part of who we are fundamentally. I mean, there'd be no light without the darkness for contrast.